making sure sure that we um, uh, we don't see the bird go into decline again. So, um, so with this, I thought I'd take just a couple slides to talk to you about the American Bird Conservancy. Um, our mission is to conserve native birds and their habitats throughout the Americas. So we're an international organization focusing on uh, North America, Central America, and South America, the Western Hemisphere. Um, this pyramid that you see here basically illustrates our conservation framework, with the top being where we spend uh, most of our energy, which is halting extinctions. Uh, and uh, of course, Kirtland's warbler was on that endangered species list. And so that's why we paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, but we, we deal with a lot of species that are, uh, that are in steep decline, threatened and endangered uh, throughout the Americas. A lot of those happen to be down in Central and South America and Hawaii uh, is, is an area that we pay a lot of attention to. That middle part of the pyramid, the orange part is protecting habitats. So that's the type of work that I do. Most of my work that I do here in the Great Lakes region is working with my colleagues and working on habitat. Right now we do a lot of forest habitat, but my other colleagues around the country also focus on, on coastlands, wetlands, grasslands, and, and other, other um, uh, habitat cover types. The next level down on the, uh, on the pyramid is that eliminating threats. So this is issues such as cats outdoors, um, um, uh, smart placement of wind towers. We believe wind is, is uh, part of our energy solution, but it's where you place them that's important. Um, of course, uh, window collisions uh, is another area that we, we focus on. We have a program to test a bird uh, friendly glass and we rate glass for the glass industry. Um, and then the bottom of the pyramid is building capacity. And this is, of course, relates to fundraising and outreach and things like that. And it's not just fundraising and outreach for, for ABC itself, but also for our partners. So, so many of our partners down in Central and South America we spend a lot of time helping them raise money. And, and I'll talk a little bit about the Bahamas National Trust when I talk about the Kirtland's Warbler. And here's another organization that we are helping them build their capacity because strong partners in the wintering grounds are critical for so many of our species. So um, just a little bit about the Great Lakes program. So in 2013, ABC officially launched a Great Lakes program. Um, so it was brand new back then. ABC did not have regional programs back then. So they experimented in 2013 uh, to create um, a Great Lakes region as well as a Western region to see if they placed key st staff members in those regions and, and concentrated on work that maybe we could um, make something happen. And as Mary mentioned five years ago, I came on board to direct that region. Um, and today I've got eight foresters working on habitat coordination uh, uh, and developing young forest habitat, mainly for golden wing warbler, but also for other related species uh, such as uh, rough grouse, um, American woodcock uh, and alike. And most of that work is happening in Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan. Many of you know Brian Lenz, our friend who used to be in charge of Bird City. Well, Brian, I was able to steal him from Bird City. So don't be mad at me for that because he's doing great work for American Bird Conservancy and is, uh, is leading up our, as our collisions campaign manager. So he's focused on helping deal with uh, window collisions and building collisions. And many of you might know he was instrumental in working with the Milwaukee Bucks to make sure that the Milwaukee Arena uh, was a bird friendly building. And right now he's working very diligently with the Obama uh, library to make sure that uh, the facility down uh, in Chicago is a bird friendly structure. Interestingly enough, that Bird City program, um, Ryan Lenz and I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, we've got an opportunity to take the great uh, to take the uh, great work of Wisconsin's Bird Cities program and take it nationally. So we just brought on Joanna Eccles, um, who's based out of Minnesota, and she's going to be our Bird City Americas coordinator. And we hope to see the program spread. About 50% of the money for Joanna's work is coming from Region 3 uh, of the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is based in the Great Lakes region. So we're going to be putting a lot of energy into getting Great Lakes programs up and running first. Uh, and then the, uh, just round out things here, Dave Ewart um, is, um, is leading expert on Kirtland's Warbler, and we were able to bring him on board three years ago as our Kirtland's Warbler director. He retired last week. Um, but um, we're going to be retaining him on a very part-time basis for the next couple of years to continue his work on Kirtland's Warbler. And Christy Heidenreich is somebody we brought on about uh, six months ago to take over as our Kirtland's Warbler coordinator. 
And so she keeps our, our committees going. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Just so you know, the success of the Great Lakes region was so successful and our program out west was so successful that this year, ABC has expanded our regional program concept. So we now have, have hired directors for several other regions. So we now have regions in the central region of the US, southwest, southeast, and the northwest regions of the United States. And we'll be expanding those programs over the next couple of years. So Kirtland's warbler. Um, Many of you probably know about this rare North American species of migratory bird uh, wintering in the Bahamas and having uh, its core breeding ground in the uh, upper regions of lower Michigan. Um, uh, but it has some, um, it also um, has occupied Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan and parts of Ontario as well. Um, it's a habitat specialist. Um, um, of course, it focuses in on those jack pine barrens landscapes and they nest on the ground in, in, in uh, uh, young, younger jack pine. Um, and they are conservation reliant, as I mentioned. So this is one of those species that, that we are always going to have to manage for them. And if we stop managing them for them, we are gonna see them in decline. So, so this is a species that even though it was delisted, as I mentioned back in 2019, uh, there's gonna be a constant effort by by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the Forest Service, by Wisconsin DNR, by Michigan DNR, and other partners to always make sure that we're constantly managing um, for the species to make sure that the that, that right age class of, of jack pine is available to them. So a little, a little bit about the success of the Kirtland's warbler. So, so here, here you can see these are population trends um, since 1951. So uh, they did a survey in, in uh, 1951 and found that there was just under 500 species in, in, six, in 1961. Uh, that number was about 500 again. Uh, and 10 years later, they, they, they did a, another survey and they saw that the numbers had declined drastically. So the number of, of, of singing males had drastically declined. And at that time, um, uh, biologists with the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service and the Michigan DNR realized they had to do something and they initially thought that most of the decline may have been due to uh, cowbird uh, predation. And so they immediately started a program to start reducing the number of cowbirds. And we're hoping that they would see some great success. But as you can see though, even after that, hopefully you can see my little crystal going around, it just stayed flat. So they, they, they knew that, that they were probably having some success by removing uh, cowbirds, but they weren't seeing a drastic increase in the number of species. Then interestingly enough, in 1980, um, the, the Forest Service was doing a, um, a prescribed burn in the Neo region of, Mayo region, excuse me, of, of Michigan. And unfortunately that fire took off. And unfortunately it killed a, a Forest Service staff member. It destroyed a couple houses and burned over 20,000 acres of jack pine in central Michigan. It became known as the Mac Lake Fire. So that happened in 1980, right at this spike here. Um, and if you notice here, all of a sudden we start seeing the, the populations increase drastically here. So basically what happened here is they realized that, that in about seven or eight years after you do a, after, after a burn and the jack pine starts coming back, you start getting jack pine at the right age class that the Kirtland's warbler start using that. And with this 20 acre, 20,000 acres available to, 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 um, to Kirtlands, they saw a dramatic increase in population at that time. And basically they recognized that, that they needed to do more management. We needed more large landscape scale management than what they were doing. Uh, and that they needed to have this continuous cycle of early successional jack pine available uh, for, for um, the species. Um, um, so as you can see, it, it took off drastically. Um, in, in 1973, with the Endangered Species Act, the Kirtland's warbler was one of the very first species listed. Uh, and in 1973, um, an advisory team that was established in 1971 was, was renamed as, as the recovery team. And they set a goal in 1973 of achieving 1,000 pair, pairs of Kirtland's warbler as their recovery goal. And once they got there, they thought they, can start, they could start the process of, of delisting. And you can see that we met that in, in early 2000. 
in the early 2000s and the population continued to increase to the point where, where we're over 2000 today. Um, but there was always a concern about delisting them without having uh, things in place. And I'll be going through some of that in just a minute here. So again, you know, how do we manage for them? Of course, cowbird control is critical. And in Michigan, um, basically two years ago, they actually stopped um, trapping cowbirds because the population had decreased so drastically um, that, that it seemed to be a very minor issue. So they're, we're now monitoring them and, and just making sure that the population does not of cowbirds doesn't increase drastically. And, we'll, and if they do, we're, we'll just gear up uh, for trapping again. But right now they seem to be holding steady. The problem though is in the UP of Michigan and in Wisconsin and in Ontario, they are still an issue. So when we look at the breeding grounds, um, here's this management I'm talking about. So, so on, on the uh, left of the screen, you'll see the uh, map of the lower Michigan um, area. The black shaded areas are state lands uh, where they do management and the lighter gray areas are forest service lands where they do management. There's about 400,000 acres of jack pine that's being managed by these two agencies um, on a rotating basis. Uh, and, and you see on, on the right, um, the upper picture here, this is that ideal habitat that the Kirtlands like, that shrubby, low, uh, young jack pine between probably ages seven and 15 years of, of age. Um, but with jack pine, we can also harvest it and generate some revenue. So, uh, but harvesting a, a 15 year old jack pine doesn't yield any, any, any revenue. So we need to have these age out to a point where there are, there, they are merchantable. Um, so, so there's this constant effort by the Forest Service and the Michigan DNR to be harvesting where they can, um, working with the timber industry, but also do constantly working on, on planting as well. And in the lower right, what you see here is a process that they started doing um, in, in the late uh, 1980s um, uh, it called it a, a, an opposable weave. So they basically planted these jack pines and, and this diamond pattern that you'll see. Those of you who know Google Earth and, and used uh, Google Maps, if you go and look at the grayling area of, of Michigan uh, on, your, on your Google map and turn on the, um, the uh, satellite view, you will see these diamond pattern uh, jack pine stands um, all over central Michigan. Um, they're now, they've now sort of abandoned this style, but, but basically it proved to be very effective. And on an annual basis uh, between the Forest Service and, and Michigan DNR, they're, they're managing approximately 20,000 acres every year recreating that harvesting and then recreating that, that um, early successional habitat. Um, so the migration of course is critical um, uh, to Kirtland's warbler and, and we didn't know a lot about their migration patterns uh, over the years. And we're just now starting to understand this. Uh, Nathan Cooper um, with the Smithsonian has been doing some, some tracking from the Bahamas up to Michigan. So, so we're seeing in the spring, they take this route where they, they seem to fly over, over to Florida and, and Atlanta and Georgia, and then take this path up to Michigan, Wisconsin and Ontario. And on the South, they take this more Southerly route, this, this dotted line uh, uh, where they, where they, where they, they fly um, uh, East and then across the ocean uh, to the Bahamas. And we're doing, we're putting up some modus towers in, in locations so that we can do some better tracking of these species. But of course, Kirtlands is a species that people want to see. A lot of people have this on their bucket list. So here you see this group of people at uh, Moggy May in um, Marsh in, um, in, um, in May um, uh, in, in um, Ohio, uh, near the Black Swamp Observatory, all getting a glimpse of, of Kirtland's warbler. And uh, in Michigan, it becomes a hotspot for birding. People all over the world show up to see uh, the Kirtland's warbler. Um, so the wintering distribution um, are on these islands that I have outlined here in the Bahamas, Eleuthera, Cat Island, San Salvador, and Log Island, with Eleuthera being kind of the, the, the hot spot. What was interesting here is we didn't know where they were wintering um, as, as late as uh, 2012. My colleague, Dave Buert, who I mentioned earlier, who's our, our, our specialist, he and, and colleagues from other organizations, um, everybody just assumed that they actually um, uh, wintered in, um, in uh, uh, Nassau, the Grand Bahama Islands, the um, Abaco, up in this area because the, the uh, Caribbean pine is there and everybody just assumed that 
they were queuing in on, on a similar sort of pine structure. So in 2012, my colleague Dave and some other scientists were researching, they were doing monitoring here, and they would come up with one or two Kirtland's warblers, and they realized, well, there's 2,000 Kirtland's warblers somewhere. Where the heck are they? And so they moved, they moved south to the southern islands, and this is where they found them. And I'll explain why in just a second here. So what they found is they were queuing in on this low shrubby um, um, habitat uh, on, these, on these southern islands where the water table is low and these shrubs, um, 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 excuse me, white sage and uh, black torch are the species here. They're a fruit bearing plant. They need that, that low water table where they can get, they can get the, um, uh, uh, where they help them produce the berries. And of course, the, the Kirtland's warbler uh, love this, this tight knit shrubby habitat, plenty of berries. There's a water, there's water there available to them. And they like this, but again, they queue in on this, this shrubby habitat. And of course, uh, white sage and black torch will grow up and they'll get too big. And then the Kirtland's warbler don't like them. So there's an, again, a need to always make sure that, the, um, that these uh, shrubs uh, stay relatively young and vibrant. Um, so, so um, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but, but our priorities for Kirtland's warbler in, in the non-breeding area are increasing that conservation capacity in, in, uh, in the Bahamas. And, and this gentleman here is the executive director of the Bahamas National Trust. He's our main partner down there. And again, we've been raising money through the Fish and Wildlife Service, Neotropical Migratory Bird Act grant and, and uh, international funds from the Forest Service to fund uh, um, a biologist with the Bahamas National Trust to help us do the mapping of the wintering habitat for the species, as well as doing mig migratory research. Uh, and we also get donations from other sources that allow the, those um, researchers to be able to do uh, research on other birds besides just Kirtland warbler while they're down there. And this messy little map that you see down below are sort of the, the results of some of the surveying that they're doing. Um, and I can't explain that map to you. I, I apologize for that. Um, but um, the management of this um, shrubby um, uh, white sage and, and, and black torch, there's a couple ways of keeping that shrub down and keep it, keeping it productive. Um, like, a lot, like a lot of shrubs, um, if you manage it and you keep it you cut back, it will keep producing fruit. You let it grow too old and it'll stop producing fruit. Um, so, so interestingly enough, hurricanes actually is one of the ways in which it naturally keeps cutting back and, 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 and being, and being uh, stunted. Um, but, but we need more habitat than what the hurricanes can produce. So the other interesting thing is the right-of-ways that the utility companies keep open for their utility lines actually starts to create um, that, that ideal habitat for Kirtland's warblers. So this is one of those areas where we're working with utility companies to encourage them to do regular maintenance of those, those shrubby lines, which they want to do anyway. The other interesting thing are goat farms. Uh, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about this, but, but the right of way for the utilities and goat farming happen to be two very low cost, large scale um, opportunities for us to keep this down. Uh, this is probably one of the only areas where ABC actually supports um, introduced mammals on islands. Um, we spend a lot of time removing cats and rats and other um, uh, mammals from islands to protect birds, but this is one of the very few areas where we actually support goat farming. So why goat farming? Well, they keep the vegetation short, as you can imagine, and that, that keeps that early successional white sage, black torch, as I, as I talked about. It keeps it prospering, keeps it fruiting. Uh, the goats require water, and in this point, as I mentioned, it has um, the low water table, so the, the um, goat farmers have access to water, uh, and that, that that water also provides high pr productivity for the fruiting plants. In this area, the way they farm the goats, of course, they fence them in and they move the fences around. Uh, so it, it prevents the, um, uh, it excludes the wild dogs from getting in and, and causing havoc with the, uh, with the goats. And as I said, it's very cost effective and it generates income for the Hamians. And there is a demand for goat meat and that demand actually exceeds what the Bahama farmers can do. So they're actually importing goat meat. So this is one of those areas where we think we can work with, uh, with where we are working with uh, the goat farmers to train younger goat farmers in this. Um, so, so we just recently got funding uh, for the last couple of years to, um, to fund uh, some um, uh, 
some assessment of these goat farm areas where we're working. So we did sampling in 2021 this year, and we're doing uh, sampling in 2022 over the winter in February and March, looking at doing plant surveys, doing point counts, doing playback, uh, identifying number of species of, of birds that we see, but also the vegetation structure and look at the amount of white sage and, and black torch that we have so that we can start doing some analysis as to um, what's most effective and what management uh, uh, is best. Um, um, so uh, if successful, we hope to promote, we, and we already are doing some of this, but we're, if it's if, if success, successful, we hope to promote goat farming on Eleuthera and San Salvador and Cat Island um, and uh, build a business model um, uh, if Kirtland's warblers are really using these newly created pastures that are, are being developed. Uh, and then again, as I'd mentioned, building capacity. So we've been raising money uh, uh, to help build capacity and, and hire staff at the Bahamas National Trust so that we've got a strong nonprofit partner down there that can continue to do the work and work with the, the, the locals that are down there uh, and expand and sustain uh, local outreach activities uh, as well and educate um, the locals about this wonderful uh, bird and its importance to the island. So our partners, um, we've got a lot of partners. So Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Forest Service, Michigan and Wisconsin DNRs. We've got a lot of academic um, organizations that are involved. Um, we've got a lot of nonprofit governmental organizations. Besides ABC, we've got the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, Bahamas National Trust. And, uh, and most recently we added a department of the Wisconsin Natural Resources Foundation, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. And um, we, we'd like to point out a couple of unsung heroes here. This Mr. Simonette, uh, this gentleman up here uh, uh, in the upper photo here is the goat farmer who uses these sustainable practices and he is now working with us to educate younger farmers, getting them introduced to goat farming and using the same sustainable practices that he does, which has shown to, um, to um, generate um, um, the type of habitat that we want. And Mrs. Oldham uh, is a teacher um, here um, uh, in, the, um, in the Bahamas who's been instrumental in educating the public about the importance of Kirtland's warbler and, and Bahamas to its wintering ground. So the threats to the birds, uh, of course, habitat loss is, is a big one. And we're so fortunate that we have in Michigan Forest Service and, and Michigan DNR holding these large tracts of land. Most of the land that the Michigan DNR owns uh, was forfeited during the depression where farmers were unable to, to survive. And of course that sandy soil just isn't good for farming anyway. So the, so the state reclaimed that land and, for, and thank goodness we're able to now manage it for equipment warbler. But the real critical thing that we're concerned about is habitat loss in the, in the Bahamas. Not just keeping the habitat that we've got, but with climate change, the next thing on the list, we're, it's projected that the Bahamas are gonna lose a lot of its land mass. And with that, we might lose some of the very areas where, where the equipment warbler are, are queuing into. The Bahamian government is actually forecasting that they might substantially lose large portions of their population because their islands aren't going to be able to sustain that many people. So they're, they're, they're already making plans now for 20 and 30 years down to, see, to make plans for where their populations will, will relocate. The sustaining the capacity, that basically is fundraising. So on an annual basis, we, our development staff and myself and Dave Ewart are always looking at where are, is the funding need, where do we need to raise money, how do we find out that funding for the Bahamas National Trust and other partners to keep doing their work? And then also sustain that, that focal group interest. So working with our partners in our various committees and working with the DNR, uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, with the Forest Service to make sure that they stay, that they have the capacity and they can sustain the management that they've got going on. And of course, invasive species is always a major concern of ours. So, so how are we resolving these threats? Um, so, um, as we got close to delisting, um, the, um, the recovery team was disbanded um, uh, about uh, 1987 and, um, and a new group was put together, a conservation team, uh, the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team. So many of the same people who were on the recovery team moved over to this conservation team, but we broke them up into three teams. So we've got a team of experts working on the breeding ground, the committee I serve on is the breeding uh, ground committee and I co-chair a subcommittee looking at expanding the breeding range. We've got the non-breeding area, D Dave Ewart and the Bahamas National Trust and other uh, researchers are involved with the, that group. And then we've got a human dimension committees. Um, each one of these committees has uh, developed a work plan 
And Dave Ewart has taken those work plans and put them into what we call a business plan for Kirtland's Warbler, which is our sort of guiding document that we put together as a roadmap for after delisting, how do we make sure we, we keep it going? And of course, con fundraising is always constant. We're, we're raising money and I'm gonna to talk to you about an endowment that we're raising for the species as well. And we're also raising money for projects, uh, cowbird control in Wisconsin and the UP uh, and active management uh, in the other regions. So ABC's involvement, um, of course, we, uh, we were asked to get involved a little over three years ago. Um, we we're a national organization with an avian focus, with an international experience. We've got experience in building partners and we're action driven. So um, our top actions over the last three years were to work on completing that full annual cycle plans, that business plan that I'm talking about. So Dave Ewart helped all three committees get their, their, their annual plans and their, and their, and their long-range plans pulled together and then compiled that into a business plan. We're building conservation capacity in the Bahamas, as I mentioned, and we're, we're looking at where are the funding priorities, and we're then concentrating our efforts on raising money in those areas. So we're working with all the partners on the, on the conservation teams, identifying where there are gaps, where partners need resources, and then we're raising money for that. And then last but not least, we're building an endowment. There's actually several uh, pools of, of endowment that are built, being created. Michigan DNR actually has $2.1 million that has been uh, set aside. A million, one of that was mitigation dollars from uh, the Enbridge um, uh, pipeline company that um, had to mitigate a, 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 an issue that they had. And then the former governor of Michigan also put a million dollars into that. And that fund is ideally designed for cowbird control in Michigan, but if that fund is not needed for Cowboy control, it can be used for other management issues. And then ABC is taking the lead on building a, a second endowment. This would be an endowment that the um, conservation teams decide where it goes. Pleased to say that we started the building the endowment over during COVID and we were successful in raising over $200,000 to start that endowment. And $25,000 of that is now based at the Wisconsin Natural Resources Foundation. And I'll end our talk talking a little bit about that, that effort. So what's next? Um, so we're basically implementing those long uh, range plans and the um, long-term commitments by the agency partners. So we've got, a, we've got the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service and Michigan DNR have entered into a long-term agreement to make sure that they continue doing their management. And our conservation teams now are monitoring that management and, and um, making sure that they're, they're keeping up with that commitment. Um, fundraising uh, for the endowment is, is ongoing and will be going for some time. And the other thing that we're doing here is because Kirtland's warbler was the first conservation reliant species to be delisted, we're working to, to develop the model that we've done for the Kirtland's warbler to be able to use it for other conservation reliant species. And we just got off a call today with Great Lakes Audubon and other partners and we're talking about is the model that we use for Kirtland's warbler, for example, a good mo model for the piping plover. Um, uh, moving forward as well. Uh, so we hope to be able to, to, to use this model for other conservation life species that potentially could be delisted. So priority projects in the breeding range, um, this is where Wisconsin comes in. So I'm gonna spend a, little, a few slides talking about what we're doing in Wisconsin for Kirtland's warbler. So, so the number one priority in the breeding range for Kirtland's warbler is expanding that range beyond the core region in Michigan. So we want to expand that range in the UP of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario. So this map is showing you where these lighter color are the areas where we're concentrating to expand the range. We actually are talking about actually working on some jack pine habitat in, in Minnesota as well, but, but this, this Wisconsin is really the hot spot where we're going to be spending a lot of energy and we're working, we're going to build a team in, in Ontario as well. So there's an area over here in Ontario. Now you can't see it on the map here, but there's another area uh, in Ontario, right in this kind of general region where we're having some success with, with Kirtland's Warbler as well. Um, so Wisconsin, so in 2007, uh, eight males were documented in the state uh, uh, for the first time. Uh, so since then, the Wisconsin DNR has been monitoring um, um, as often as possible, been doing a census um, uh, almost every year uh, and watching this population uh, grow and, and over, over time. Uh, and it, we just completed the uh, 2021 census a couple of weeks ago. We don't have results of that, um, but, um, but we have over time confirmed Kirtland warblers in um, Adams, Bayfield, Douglas, Jackson, Marinette, and Vilas counties. 
Uh, and the 2020 census found them in these counties that you see here. Um, sort of the hot spots are Adams County and, and Marinette County. Um, and um, a lot of effort's been going into Adams County and I'll explain that in just a little bit here. And so these are kind of, oops, oops sorry, let me go back up. Um, oop, wrong direction, there we go. So these were kind of the hot spots in 2020. And this, this area here, Sand Valley Restoration, this area here, here in Adams County is, is, is gonna be a hot spot for a while. Uh, this was a, um, a, um, uh, a red pine uh, plantation. Uh, so timber industry basically bought tens of thousands of acres here, eliminated the jack pine and planted red pine, a much more profitable species here. Um, so over time, different um, timber companies have owned it. The DNR owns two um, easements uh, on, on some of this land and, added, and the easements allow DNR to actively manage about 5,500 acres. And this is where we're seeing the response from Kirtland Warbler in this area. And this is probably where we're going to be doing most of our, our efforts over the next few years. Uh, and most recently, um, Sand Valley Golf Course purchased the, the land that was owned by the timber company and is working hand in hand with myself, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DNR in terms of coming up with a, a long-term management plan for the site and gradually removing the, jack, the, the um, red pine and reintroducing jack pine into the area. And almost done here, but a couple things to point out. As I mentioned, the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin, um, uh, last year, uh, we partnered with them. Uh, we were going to hold a in-person uh, fundraising event at Mary Corcor's uh, property in, in, in uh, North Lake. Many of you probably know Mary. She's president of uh, Wisconsin Society of Ornithology. But you might have heard of this COVID-19 thing that popped up. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel our, our fundraiser, our in-person fundraiser. So we regrouped and we planned a virtual Zoom fundraiser later in the year. And I'm pleased to say that we were able to raise $25,000 and start this fund at the Natural Resources Foundation. So this will be a fund for uh, Kirtland's Warbler work in Wisconsin. The $25,000 is seed money to get the fund established. I'm working right now with the DNR and we're gonna be setting a new goal for how large we wanna build this endowment for Kirtland's Warbler uh, at the Natural Resources Foundation. So any of you who are interested in supporting Kirtland's Warbler work, you've got a couple options. You can contribute directly to the American Bird Conservancy and we will transfer the funds over to the Natural Resources Foundation for this fund. Or those of you who already have a relationship with the Natural Resources Fund or want a relationship with the Natural Resources Foundation, you can reach out directly to them and, and make a contribution directly to them. The other exciting thing that's happened is um, ABC in January found out that we received a $5 million grant through the uh, US um, uh, Department of Agriculture through their Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's a program called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. This is the program that we've been using the last six years to do, uh, excuse me, do um, golden wing warbler work uh, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And I'm pleased to say that this time when we asked for renewal, we included about $600,000 of that uh, grant to also do work in jack pine habitat mainly in upper Michigan and Wisconsin. And with this grant, we now are going to have about $600,000 to work with private landowners uh, to help them develop management plans for their properties and help restore jack pine habitat for, for Kirtland's warblers. Most of that money will probably be happening in Adams and Jackson County, maybe even Marinette County in Wisconsin. With that, I just wanna thank you um, again, my name is Sean Groff. There is my, uh, my um, email address and my phone number. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if, if you have any questions. You can also go to ABC's website and get my contact information. And with that, I just want to say again, thank you and be happy to take any questions that you might have. Excellent. Wow. So um, Sean, we're just going to ask you to stop sharing and then you we'll bet. go back to the gallery view and then people then can have the opportunity to um, basically be able to see them and they can ans ask questions then uh, in person if they unmute themselves or if they feel more comfortable, they can type their question into the chat and then I'll just read those questions to you um, after they've, they've entered them. But um, anybody have any questions for Sean? Amazing work you're doing. It's a, 
and that huge grant that that was quite a feather in your hat holy yes. smokes a lot of work but it was worth it yeah i bet yeah so um are, are there other organizations that are benefiting by that same grant or are you basically it's abc that's that's um going to be utilizing the funds We'll, we'll be, um, um, so the way that fund works is it's a cost share with private landowners. So it's covering the cost of, of five foresters working in the three states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, and they will be doing outreach to landowners. Uh, and um, most of that money will actually be a cost incentive that will go to a landowner to, to help subsidize their management of their forest to make it more friendly for equipment growers. So it could be anything from removing red pine, removing invasives, to, to planting jack pine, to you know uh, any number of things that would make the, the, the property more suitable for for Kirtland's warbler and other species that would use, of course, that that jack pine habitat. So there's a lot of pollinators, for example, carnivore blue butterfly uses that habitat as well. So hopefully, um, we'd be helping out a lot of other species. But we sure. but we part but we'll part but we'll be partnering with several other organizations. So Rough Grouse Society is another key partner of ours. Um, um, the, uh, again, Forest Service will be a key partner. Um, Wisconsin DNR will be the beneficiary of, of much of this work. Wow, huge, just a huge feather in your hat. So, this, is Jerry, this is Jerry Mead. Yes, uh, Jerry. I had a question, is that area you're talking about, Navs County, right off, uh, that area right off of uh, Highway C? Uh, yes, hi, yes, yes, yeah, if you, right, uh, one okay. of the areas is, is Highway C, which is, which is, um, I'm just trying to think of, um, uh, what's the, what's the crossroad there? Um, I can't, I can't remember, I got it on, I haven't been there for several years, but I got it, I got it on my GPS, so I, yeah. I just yeah. hit Warbler spot. Yes, exactly, and, and just so you know, if you're interested in seeing Cortland's Warbler, um, the, uh, Natural Resources Foundation, their, their field trips, they were doing annual field trips out to this general area every year for the last several years. Although of course they didn't do it last year, they didn't do it this year, but my guess is that starting next year, they'll, they'll start that trip up again. And, yeah, I and, think Daryl Tesson was doing some, wasn't he? Yep, yep, yep. And, it's a, and yeah, so DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and, and they'll take you right out to the, uh, the Sand Valley land that's being actively managed for it. And, and I was out there helping out two years ago, uh, and um, a couple of us were able to see the Kirtland's Warbler, but he was shifty, and mm -hmm. we sure could hear him. We could sure hear him. So. Yeah. <laughs> so how many people do they allow on that field trip? I know it's pretty exclusive. Yes, yes. So it's basically one school bus full, so it's about 40-ish that they'll sure. allow go, and then and they'll, they'll break it up into two smaller groups so that, that, so that you're not overwhelming the woods, you know, so... And they'll take you out to different sites and show you different aspects of the work that's being done. Excellent. Wow. What an opportunity. Very competitive, though, I'm sure. So do you yes, have any so, idea what, what that field trip costs? I know that, you know, there's a, a kind of a higher fee because it is, you know, the opportunity to see an endangered species. Right. I believe it was $40. And again, okay. most of that is not to cover the cost of the trip. Uh, uh, most of it goes to the... Uh, the um, the Bird Conservation Fund that uh, NRF has. So when that booklet comes out, book that Kirlin's Warbler trip first thing, because well, it does fill up fast. <laughs> I would imagine it does. Have you seen, anybody else seen the Kirtland's Warbler, had the opportunity to go on that field trip? Doesn't look like it. Boy, you were one of the rare ones then, Sean, having that, <laughs> that opportunity. So any other questions? I, I'm kind of curious, it's like, you know, it's kind of odd that the Kirtland's Warbler is using the northern part of the state. There are a number of, of different locations up there that you guys have been working on and have found the Kirtland's. How in the world did they manage to find a spot smack in the middle of the state? I mean, it's so disjointed from the other areas they're in. Yes, yeah, so, so the, they really don't have an expl expl explanation for it other than when you're looking at that migratory pattern that they've got. If I went back from map, you can see, of course I have this, the solid line which shows you sort of the, the, the middle of the zone, but it's a wide zone that they're taking. And, 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 and so they're queuing in on that specialized habitat. Sure. So when you get up in that region, like up in Bayfield and, and Douglas County, there are vast stands of that sandy, barren uh, landscape. So, so they're just thinking of that as they're, they're migrating, they're seeing that they're queuing in on it and they're coming down. 
Sure. Uh, one of the things that you see in um, Douglas Bayfield, Crawford counties, is that they'll find the singing males, but they don't often, or they don't think they don't think they see the, find the females, so they move on. Oh. Um, but luckily, the Marinette, Adams, Jackson County, they're finding they're finding the females as well. So keep your fingers Excellent. crossed. Sure. So we have a question in the chat. Um, basically, they're asking what can be done about cowbirds. How can you discourage them? You know, um, they're they're coming all over. You know, to feeders and so on, and and uh, they're a huge hassle. But um, and yet, you know, they're not one of the species that you can do anything yeah. about to control them. Right. Right. So so the DNR, um, you know, basically in the active um, management area for Kirkland's warbler, they do trap them. So I should have pointed out in that slide that I showed you that big cage that was there in the cowbird's um, slide. It basically was a big cage. Um, they, they, they place a male cowbird in the cage. As he sings, he attracts other males as well as females. They fly into the, the, the trap is set up that they can get in, but they can't get out. Mm. Um, and then of course they're, they're euthanized. And, and of, of course, um, you know, cowbirds, you know, they're named because they followed the buffalo herds, of course. So and we, we got these areas where there was a lot of agriculture. That's they like they love these big open areas, right? So so what, one of the things that they think is happening in the jack pine uh, areas in, in Lower Michigan, and the reason the population hasn't increased a lot is is we we don't have a lot of open landscape anymore because there isn't a lot of agriculture in that area, and the, and the shrubby the shrubby um, jack pine is taking over. Um, so so the the cowbirds basically. We reduced this population enough. They're not. They're not hanging around. Um, so we got to do the same thing in Wisconsin, essentially. <laughs> sure, makes sense. What What about though? Just I mean, people cannot trap them um, at their bird feeders. Uh, perhaps just switching the kind of seed you're offering. They don't seem to care for sunflowers. I would imagine. Yeah, they they they, they they're not. Yeah, they'll but they'll eat sunflowers. I've tried everything. I, I I'm sorry. I've tried everything. <laughs> And they still show up, yeah. but uh, yeah, I tried. I tried sunflowers, and you're right. They they're not. There's no, they're not as keen of the sunflower as they are of millet and, and the other stuff. But um, sure. and of course, you know, um, my favorite birds use the sunflower seeds, so that's usually what I use anyway. Sure. Yep. Kind of a trade-off. Any other questions for Sean? Go ahead, I William. I had a question about the uh, the name. Now that we have this conversation going on about renaming. Um, bird species. Uh, what's the source of the name for this bird, and what do you think about changing the name, and what would it be too? Yes. Yeah, so, the, so um, um, this subject has come up. So, so basically, it's named after a dentist who was the first one to to identify it, and so far, he seems to be a reasonably good fella. It doesn't have too many <laughs> character flaws, uh, but that could always change, right? Um, um, so, so Dave Ewart, who's very uh, those of you who don't know Dave, if you ever get a chance to see Dave or have him give a talk, he's just an amazing, amazing ornithologist um, and um, has, been, has been working on Kirtland's Warbler for almost 40 years and, and has dedicated his career to migratory birds. Um, but anyway, he has been working with the committee and, um, and it, it does not seem likely that the Kirtland's Warbler name will change. And, and if it does, it's not gonna be anytime soon. Um, so, so, and if it does change, the thought is that we should name it after, after something about its attribute, whether that's the Bahamas warbler or the Michigan warbler or the jack pine warbler. It'd be something to do with its attributes of where it lives or what it what it does type type of thing. Um, so that's that. But don't expect it anytime soon, um, <laughs> unless you can help dig up some some uh, dirt on Dr. Uh, Kirtland. <laughs> Well, it's a possible fundraiser. You could have one of those contests where everybody gets to, um, you know, send in their favorite name or whatever, and then have them bid on it or whatever, you know, so, yeah. but I like the choices you had suggested, you know, it's the jack pine warbler or whatever, that, that seems to make sense. So I'm curious because it's in the background with your picture right now, the gold wing warbler, what, you know, what's happening with them? Yes, so there's a species in steep decline, as many of you probably right. know. Um, and, um, and again, a, a lot of it is attributed to habitat loss. Um, and, um, uh, and there's some work down in Central and South America looking at their, 
their wintering grounds as well. And again, it seems to be habitat loss down there as well. So it's kind of getting whacked on both ends of the, of the spectrum. Um, so um, there's two breeding areas in the US, the Appalachian region. Um, you know, that's that Pennsylvania, West Virginia, parts of New York. That's a smaller population there. And there, they're really struggling. And again, they like Kirtlands, but different cover type. They like that early successional habitat. Another, again, another ground nester, um, and, but very unique specialist. Um, so they ground nester, but they need to fledge to a mature forest. So you need to have these pocket openings of early successional habitat of aspen or alder is what they prefer next to a larger stand of a more mature forest. So, um, and, and because they're the most finicky of all the species that uses these, these early successional habitats, we, we manage for golden wings and we get the whole suite of other early successional habitat birds, the, the, um, the rough grouse, the uh, uh, American woodcock, uh, thrive on these areas as well. So we manage for Kirtlands and we, we, we get a bonus kind of a situation. So the other re region where, they're, where, they're, um, uh, where, where we have the largest population is Wisconsin, Michigan, and, and uh, Minnesota. And again, uh, probably the reason that we've got the larger population there is that we have an active timber industry. So there's active aspen um, management. Alder is not a wood that, that's managed for, but, but people who want alder stands know that alder is one of those species that if you want alder to thrive, you have to harvest it every, you know, every decade or so uh, because it thrives and comes back strong. Um, and if you don't do that, it, it age classes Ooh. out and then it just deteriorates. So, yeah. so, so what's going on in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota is my foresters, again, are working with private landowners to encourage them to, do, to manage their alder. Uh, and we're working with landowners to manage their aspen stands. And aspen is one where they can actually get um, a forest industry will, will harvest their, their aspen stands. And aspen is, again, one of those species that you harvest it and it will re-sprout and come back and come back vigorously. Um, but then we're also working on, on public lands as well. So I've got a forester who's a uh, public lands forester. So we're raising money to do work on public lands as well. So we're working with the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, state agencies, county agencies, tribal lands, and we're doing work on, on, on their properties as well. Um, and, and so far, I can tell you this, we've been doing five years of surveys with, with uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania on our sites that we've been monitor, managing in Wisconsin and Minnesota and our numbers are very solid. We're seeing, we're, in the managed areas that we're doing, we're seeing response within a couple of years after managing alder stands uh, where, where, the, where the, the golden wings are responding. So cross your fingers we, that we can turn the yeah. corner on, on, on golden wing warbler and keep their population stable. Well, we certainly hope that's the case. Yeah, we used to have them at River Edge and once I know. they started to mature, that was it for them. You know, we've got yep. the blue wing, but not the golden wing anymore. Yep. Here, Huris <laughs> Lake had, had a couple too way back when. So yeah, I bet. same thing. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's wonderful. All these efforts are, are really helping a whole lot of other species, not just the ones, the target species, but, but so many others. So it's well worth it. Any last questions for Sean before we sign off for the evening? I think that might be it for the evening. So I do want to remember or remind everybody that the next meeting um, will be on August 3rd. And that, that program will be um, on the changing world of birding, um, including information about the uh, bird, bird, uh, badger land birding and the internet. So please join us for the next meeting on the 3rd. And would like to thank Sean for you know an amazing program and all the work that you're putting into these, these um, various different species. We all benefit by them. So we're so thankful for the work you're doing. Um, and again, you want to remind people where they might donate if, if they um, felt like it for, for the benefit of these species? Yep, yes, absolutely. So you have two options. Um, one is if you go to the American Bird Conservancy website and just, just in the search bar in our website, just do Kirtland's Warbler and you'll be directed to the Kirtland's Warbler page and there's a donation button there which will allow you to donate to the, um, the fund and, and if you want it for Wisconsin, just put a little message in there that it's for the Wisconsin fund and we'll make sure it gets over to the Natural Resources Foundation. Those of you who know Natural Resources Foundation, um, um, you can reach out directly to them, either go through their website and contact one of their, 
or their officers, um, or um, uh, you know, they probably even have a donate button on their website as well. But you can donate directly to them as well, uh, and the money will go to the Kirtland's Warbler Club. Just let them know it's for the Kirtland's Warbler Club. Excellent. Seems simple enough. So I hope everyone will think about donating. That it's a very worthwhile cause. So anyhow, I hope everybody has a good evening and, and a um, fun rest of the month. And we will see you in August. And, uh, and Sean, uh, you can expect a little um, surprise in the mail from the Bird Club one of these days, too. So thanks again for presenting. And, and uh, have a great summer, everyone. We'll see you next month. Good night, hey, all. Everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.